Morning. Uh, so firstly, I just want to say it's wonderful seeing so many people that I recognize, but it's even more than that, seeing so many people that I don't recognize. Uh, I used to be much more active in the GNOME community than I am these days, but seeing that since I stopped being such an active participant, the community has continued to grow and continues to attract new developers is wonderful. Uh, and so it's a great pleasure to be able to be here and talk to you today. As was mentioned, uh, my name's Matthew Garrett. I work for CoreOS. I, I'm not going to be directly talking about things that I work on in my day-to-day -to -day work today, but the kinds of concepts that I'm talking about, the idea that we should be concentrating on building software that prioritizes security, safety, is something that is core to what I do work on. And so, Many of the things I'll be touching on today are things that I am actively interested in developing. Uh, there's various components that I'm working on that have some relationship to this. But anyway, back to the immediate focus. These days, software is everywhere. It's very difficult to get through the day without using software. If you phone up anybody and you're asking for help with something, usually the first thing they'll suggest is, well, have you tried checking our website? Have you looked the details there? If you end up going further and they want to know how to get in touch with you, they'll probably ask for an email address. And you might be, I really don't want these people emailing me. And so you're, I don't have an email address. And then they don't believe you because that's an obvious lie. Everybody has an email address. It's Great, we're able to do things we've never thought of before as a result of this. I can book flights without having to talk to people, which is amazing. In fact, I can do almost everything I want to without having to talk to people, which makes my life so much better. But the cost of this is that we give a lot of information, either directly or indirectly, to the software that we're using. Software knows a lot about us. Both software that we use directly Obviously, my email app knows who I email and who I get email from. But in other contexts, we are giving that information away in a more indirect manner. If I'm using a web browser, then tracking information that's not directly related to my use of the web browser will allow people to identify things about me. This allows them to generate, obviously, targeted adverts, which is Implicit in a kind of interesting way, I'll often search for something because I already own it and I want to find out more about how I should be using it. And then I start getting adverts for that thing. The fact that I'm looking at the user's guide is possibly an indication that I don't need to buy another. Or that if I do, I probably know where to find it. So. In some ways, the same grace is that the software is not always very good at making use of our secrets, but the software knows a huge amount about what we do. Any kind of social interaction is likely to be tied together with software because software knows where we are. Even if I'm involved in some sort of social relationship that involves no direct use of software at all, the fact that I'm carrying a phone around and the other person is carrying a phone around will allow the information our software is collecting about us to be used to tie us together. If these two phones keep turning up in the same location, that's an indication that there's probably a link between the people owning those phones. Even if we are not telling the phone where we are, even if we're not telling the phone that we're meeting this person, Someone with sufficient insight into the information that's being collected about us can tie that together, can learn even more about who we are, about how we're spending our time. Until recently, software didn't know when we were sleeping, but software does tend to know when we're awake. Most people don't use software when they're sleeping. Uh, Fitbit and so on have kind of changed that. And this is, in itself, a kind of scary thing. If we're 
suddenly changing our sleep patterns, if we're suddenly sleeping in different places, again, this indicates something about us that is important and relevant to people. This is information that can be collected about us and that can potentially be used in either embarrassing or even more harmful ways. At best, it might just mean that vendors use this information about our sleep schedules to figure out when it's worth buying advertising on TV. But one of the stranger aspects of this is that fundamentally software doesn't care. The software itself collects all this information in a completely amoral manner. The software is not judging us as a result of this information. The software sits there quietly collecting, quietly gathering information, quietly handing that off to other people. But the software itself is almost always, there are cases where software has been deliberately designed to collect user data, to do so in ways that are actively hostile. So key loggers, for instance, are a case of where arguably in some ways the software is itself the embodiment of a moral choice in that case. We're collecting information about this user so that we can break into their email account, so that we can break into their bank account. But in most cases, that's not true. The software is just a conduit for this information. The software is doing exactly what you want it to do, but in the process, it is creating additional information that can be gathered. So when we write software, it's very easy for us to think, well, I'm just designing the software. Sure. The fact that it's designed this way means that someone could potentially gather this information and use it, but that would be their choice, not my choice. I'm just writing software. That's not really a defensible position. When we write software, we have to be aware of all the consequences of our design decisions. If we write software that makes it easy for people to obtain additional information about us, they will do so. That's unfortunately a combination of market factors, uh, it's not being illegal, and also there just being a fascination with learning more about people so that you can, in a sort of standard corporate quote, serve their needs better or improve your levels of service. So when we, as people developing software, design our software, we need to start thinking more carefully about what the consequences of our design decisions are. When we're writing software, when we're designing software, are we doing so in a way that helps users? Or are we doing so in a way that provides excessive benefits to people who are collecting information about users? One of the things that we obviously care about when we're writing software is security. People don't like writing insecure software. Insecure software is a problem for many reasons. Uh, obviously, there's the, I'm running insecure software, someone's able to break into my computer through the insecure software, and then potentially they're able to use that as a conduit into the my company network. They're able to obtain all kinds of things they shouldn't be able to obtain. At best, insecure software is often basically a uh, opportunity for software to just crash. Someone attempts to exploit a vulnerability in a piece of software, gets it slightly wrong, and then suddenly your browser crashes, or your plugins crash, or your entire desktop session crashes, depending on what's going on. So at best, failures can care about sorry, at best failures care about security can be a gross inconvenience for users. At worst, it can be something that compromises their entire employment, life, whatever. Yeah, there's ways that allowing insecure software onto someone's systems can have a really strongly negative aspect on them. And when we talk about security, we often think about it in the sort of, well, we're writing code that has to be resistant to hackers. We're writing code that must not allow people to gain control of my webcam without my permission. 
So while there are cases where we are thinking about this in terms of does this allow people to steal information that I have access to but which doesn't belong to me, there is also much more about we care about protecting the privacy of that individual user. If my corporate network is sufficiently secure, then someone breaking into my laptop is not necessarily going to be able to get much further than that. They'll have access to everything I have access to, but no more. But if they are able to gain access to enough information about me, they're potentially going to then be able to blackmail me into doing more than that. Or it doesn't even necessarily have to be about that. They can use that information in other ways to make my life difficult. They can potentially notice things that indicate that I am engaged in behavior that is arguably criminal and then use that against me. And so when I talked about some of this at Squadec a couple of years ago, uh, Frederick, maybe yeah. instead of talking about these as two completely distinct issues, like security and privacy, both of which are quite intertwined, we should instead talk about an overarching concept of safety. The idea that we should write software that is fundamentally safe, software that does not have security mm -hmm. issues, but software which also does not have privacy issues. I think this is a very useful tool to think about. Often when we're talking about privacy issues, people can get caught up in the idea that, well, uh, privacy is all about you know, cryptography, everything being encrypted, making sure that nothing is visible to anybody. And then security as being, well, we use many of the same tools, but we use them for a different purpose. Security is a, we avoid people breaking into things. And privacy advocates and security advocates are often not the same people. The two can even occasionally be quite, uh, can occasionally work in ways that are opposed to each other. So I think the idea that instead of talking about one or the other, we talk about something that encompasses both and that focuses on the idea that many of our security improvements are focused on improving privacy and many of our privacy improvements are to an extent also benefiting security means that having this term of safety is an important one. So I really liked that suggestion. My idea. When we're talking about this kind of thing, when we're talking about security, when we're talking about privacy, it's important to think about who we're protecting and what are we protecting them against. And in the security industry, this is known as threat modeling. Once you've identified things you care about, then you can work on them. But if instead you're just saying, oh, this is a potential issue, we should fix it, but you're not thinking about who the potential attackers are or whether they will actually be deterred by this modification, you don't know how to prioritize your time. So figuring out exactly what your model of attack is, is a vital part of any of this work. Now in this post Snowden era, we're obviously aware that there is giant overarching collection of data by governments, by intelligence agencies, obviously within the United States, but also in several other countries. Uh, the UK has similar levels of data collection to the US, GCHQ have, in several cases, produced techniques that the NSA have relied upon in order to obtain information about people. There's often collaboration between these governments, but there's also often competition between them, trying to outdo each other in order to obtain more information about people so that they can be the ones who break a a criminal organization rather than another country, uh, or giving them leverage in terms of negotiating information transfer. We have this tool that you don't have. Tell us more about how you're collecting this data. We'll share that. The problem with this is that while governments, yes, are watching us, and while it is difficult to solidly protect ourselves against governments when those governments are able to turn up 
seize everything we own and then put us in a small room for the next 15 years until we tell them what they want to know. Once governments can do something, criminal organizations can probably do the same. It's really not that big a leap from one to the other. After all, this is just software. Right. Governments are able to do things involving massive collection of data more effectively because they're able to insist that phone companies install additional hardware or they can tap fiber in a way that nobody's going to argue about. But criminal organizations can do pretty much everything up to that point. And what we've seen is that there are now criminal or uh, there are semi even semi legitimate organizations who are coming up with these techniques, who are basically weaponizing security issues, and in many cases inventing, discovering their own, and are then selling that to governments. So while the US government is doing most of its own development here, while most tools that they use were invented by them, smaller countries don't tend to have those resources. They instead go to organizations like Hacking Team, which was an Italian company who specialized in providing, I think they described it as intelligence software, which was in reality, hey, you want to keep track of these people in your country, we will sell you software that allows you to do that. And this ranged from things that were just exploits against, say, various versions of Android, so that you could drop a rootkit onto someone's phone and then have them tracked directly by their phone, run arbitrary stuff on their phone. So even if they were using encrypted communication mechanisms on their phone, since you were running on the phone, you could still extract all that information from them. You could just watch every key press that they made. But going even further, they were providing hacks for system firmware. If you were able to get hold of someone's laptop, you could infect it in a way that meant even if they reinstalled Windows, Windows was automatically be reinfected by their system firmware and would again keep track of everything. So these people are, as far as they're concerned, involved in the free market. They're doing work that someone's willing to pay for. And people are paying for it. And this has been used by foreign governments to track journalists, to track activists. There's strong indications that this has been used to imprison people who have been arguing against government actions in various countries. When we fail, when we produce software that has security vulnerabilities, these people will be out there trying to take advantage of our failings, trying to make money off our failings, and happily allowing people who are arguing for basic human rights to be imprisoned. When we get it wrong, people suffer in a very real way. But focusing on this sort of thing can be misleading. If we're purely thinking about cases where, well, OK, we need to protect against governments. We need to protect against governments who are able to come up with this themselves. We need to protect against governments who are able to spend enough money on purchasing exploits and making use of those against us. There's still the argument that, well, you know, sure, we can protect against some of this, but ultimately the government's still going to be able to come to your door, break it down, arrest you, and do whatever they want. And there's an element of truth to that. If the NSA really care about you, really care about obtaining additional information about you, you're probably going to have a bad time. There's not a lot we can do about all of that. At some level, they are big enough that they probably can interfere with hardware manufacturers. They probably can embed backdoors so deep that it is impossible for us to identify them, impossible for us to do anything about them. So that's true. But we shouldn't just think about security 
or safety in those terms. And this is actually, again, a case of where using the term security could be misleading and where safety is actually very important. Computers are potentially a means of control. In abusive relationships, it is often the case that partners <coughs> will seek to control their partner. They will seek to find out everything they can about what they're doing in order to have influence over that, control over that. If they are able to track you through your phone, if they are able to see who you're emailing, if they're able to see who you're having conversations with online, that's information that they can use against you. In the worst case, that's information they can potentially use to find you again if you've left. There are real cases of people in the IT industry using the access they have to systems to find people who've left them, who've run away. And there are cases where they have used that information in order to have more control over their partner. So sure, we can't just think about this in terms of governments, because that way it's very difficult for us to ever feel that we're making a real difference. But we can think about this in terms of protecting against people like ourselves. Not everybody in the software industry is a fine, upstanding individual. It should not be possible for us to violate the trust that people have placed in our software. I think this is one of the most compelling parts of the safety argument. People who use our software should be safe from us. They should be safe from other people that they either trust now or trusted at some point in history. They should feel that when they give information to the software we have produced, that that information cannot be used against them. I think that is the most important part of safety. That is why it is such a vital part of our work. So what can we do? There's many things we can do. The fact that we are here together working on a large free software project actually gives us a strong advantage. Now, you may have heard this quote, many eyes make bugs shallow. The idea that since we have the source available to all our software, since we are a large community of people very interested in that software, that we will spot new bugs as they're introduced into the code, that we are more likely to spot old bugs that already exist because we'll be reading through code trying to figure out a bug, we'll notice something and we'll think that's strange and we'll fix it. So there is an assumption that because we're working on free software, we are automatically in a better position because we're less likely to introduce, less likely to maintain security bugs. This isn't especially true, sadly. It's very easy to tell ourselves that the fundamental nature of our development process is already leaving us in a better position. But that's not really the case. And pretending that it is can result in us making poor decisions, can result in us letting people down. There's actually multiple factors at play here. So obviously, the heart release bug, something that has been sitting in OpenSSL for years, and which was only recently discovered. Now, potentially, the fact it was discovered is great. Uh, someone looking at the source code identified this issue, it got fixed. In a sense, that is exactly what we would expect to see. But it was there for so long that it's difficult to argue that we really demonstrated our virtues in that case. It doesn't help that OpenSSL is almost entirely unreasonable, but even so, that's not a staggering success story on our part. We have evidence that the NSA have exploits 
for various pieces of free software that are still current, that are still useful to them. And yet we don't know what they're targeted against. We have not seen enough evidence of them being used in the wild for us to be able to identify the vulnerability that they're exploiting. And we've got lots of people looking at that code. We've got lots of people trying to fix it. And even so, we have reason to believe that there are still exploitable vulnerabilities in various pieces of core code. But also, not all the things that we care about in the context of safety bugs are bugs in the sense of this code does not do what this code was supposed to do. We are potentially leaking information in contexts where that seemed like a completely reasonable design decision. And it's not a security issue in the sense of it's not going to allow arbitrary code execution. It's not going to leak information in an unexpected way for the developer. But that's still something that could give away information that is relevant to someone's safety. And so we still need to care about that. And the many eyes thing does not necessarily help us there either. So in itself, the mere fact that we're writing free software is not enough here. We need to do better. And our strengths are not just in our technical differences. Thus, our strengths are not a result of the fact that our development process is more open, that we are writing code in a way that allows people to examine and perform code review in a much more transparent way than any proprietary vendor. Our strengths are instead much more around our social focus. And part of that is that thinking about safety means, going back to the idea of threat bubbles, means understanding as many cases as possible where user data can be used against users. Having a diverse community, having representation from as many different walks of life as possible, means that we're much more likely to be able to identify cases where data we hold, data that we transmit, data that we store in any way, is relevant to user safety. But there's also the fact that from a commercial point of view, we don't need to collect user data. Microsoft for a long time were, yeah, Windows problematic in a large number of ways. But Microsoft themselves didn't really have to collect much user data. Windows itself wasn't a privacy violation. But the market has been changing. Microsoft used to make money off Windows by selling copies of Windows. People don't really buy Windows anymore. People buy laptops or desktops that have Windows pre-installed, <clears throat> and then either they buy a new piece of hardware before that version of Windows' life cycle has expired, or Microsoft give you a free upgrade, because that's kind of the expected thing to happen now in the operating system world. So Microsoft have had to respond to this by figuring out other ways to make money from Windows. And part of that is much broader collection of user data, user behavior, and then transmitting that back to Microsoft and allowing Microsoft to make use of that for commercial purposes. If you install Windows 10, by default, quite a lot of information about you gets passed back to Microsoft, and Microsoft reserved the right to use that information for commercial purposes. We don't need to do that. I really hope that this is not a situation that we ever find ourselves having to deal with. But right now, the way we work, the way we're funded, means this just isn't a consideration. We have no incentive to collect a lot of this data in the first place. Data that isn't collected cannot then later be used against someone. So we're already off to a good start. And we don't need to monitor user behavior for the same sort of reasons. We're not looking at 
how they're using systems in order to figure out how to sell them things. We're not collecting information about the websites that they visit in order to identify patterns to figure out whether a user is to figure out which socioeconomic class a user is in in order to tailor offers that are made to them. Instead, we can prioritize the user. We can ensure that what information we are collecting, what information we are able to see about the user's behavior is only ever used in ways that are directly in the user's interests. We should not be using them in any way that benefits us if, in doing so, the user is harmed or potentially harmed. And we're in a pretty unique position here. It's very difficult to do this kind of thing if you are a single billion dollar company or several billion dollar company. This is arguably one of the biggest strengths we have, one of the strongest ways we can continue to differentiate ourselves against proprietary operating systems. And when I say proprietary operating systems, I'm including, obviously, Windows and OS X, but also Android, Chrome OS. These are things that, even while based to a large extent on top of free software, are not in themselves free software and which are not fundamentally respecting the privacy of the user, the safety of the user. They are designed to benefit Google commercially. We're not there yet. The GNOME platform has the potential to be the safest operating environment. But right now, we're not there. And in order to get from where we are to where we want to be, we need a focused plan. And this cannot be something that we just think about in terms of retrofitting on top of our existing code base. Every new piece of code that is written should be written with a consideration for the safety of users. We need to identify our expectations for the behavior of components of the GNOME platform, and we need to ensure that all work that is done on these components represents the embodiment of those principles. So part of that, to begin with, is identifying the things that people care about, the things that are relevant to their safety. As I mentioned before, having a diverse community here is a huge benefit. If your community is primarily made up of people with high levels of privilege, people who have never been in a position where someone is attempting to use their behavior against them, then you're likely to miss a lot of fundamental things. You need to spend a lot of time talking to people from a huge range of different backgrounds, identifying how they use computers, figuring out what information they're putting into those computers, and thinking about how people could use that information against them. We are ourselves not going to be able to do that particularly well. We need a strong, diverse community in order to benefit from this. Once we've identified the things that people do care about, the things that are relevant to their safety, we need to audit everything and identify cases where that information is currently leaking. <clears throat> A lot of things that were perfectly reasonable design decisions 20 years ago have been carried over to the present day, and those design decisions may not look so great anymore. And we've understood that at a technical level for a long time. We rewrite components not because we desperately like writing code that already exists. We do it because we want to do a better job. We know more now about software than we did 20 years ago. And this has to be applied not only to the code itself, but to the behavior of the code. Things like no more HTTP anymore. <laughs> With the exception of users going to an HTTP-only website, 
our platform should not be making any HTTP connections. Anyone in the network path between a user and the site they're talking to knows exactly what they're asking for and knows exactly what response they get back. Now, some of that is, seems kind of harmless. Uh, so say I ask for the weather over HTTP. What's the harm there? The weather is not secret. But by doing so, I'm gaining information about where a user currently is. And if not necessarily directly where a user currently is, I'm gaining information about places that that user cares about. Maybe they're currently appearing on an IP address that resolves to somewhere in LA, but they're asking for the weather in London. Well, that's a user who's potentially about to get on a plane at LAX. They've just reset their location in order to see what the weather's going to be like when they arrive. Anything, no matter how trivial it seems, that's going over HTTP should not be. And we need to audit everything. We need to identify cases where this is still happening, and we need to fix them. We need full support for data encryption at as many levels as possible. Now, the gold standard here is arguably full disk encryption. But that's not ideal in a number of cases. One thing that we do, uh, or at least traditionally have done, and it's possible that this has now been changed, and if so, someone please do correct me. But libvte stores uh, the backlog of a terminal session in plain text. I believe this has been changed. This has now been changed? Yeah. Okay, great. So previously, it was something that was basically there in plain text. And that made that was a good design decision. We don't want to have to stick the entirety of your back scroll in RAM, because that can end up taking a lot of RAM, and then people start complaining that GNOME Terminal is bloated, because, well, yes, it's taking up 100 megs of RAM, because we've got 100 megabytes of data in your scroll back buffer, because that's what you asked for. But having that information in plain text even if it was stored in a way that could not be persisted across reboots, is still a problem. That's still giving attackers a lot more insight into your behavior in an unnecessary way. And so the idea of making sure that even stuff like that is encrypted is important. There's a lot of integration with hardware we can be doing. As of July, any system newly certified to run Windows 10. So any laptop that hits the market in July or later must have TPM functionality. Microsoft now require that. TPM is a small hardware device that can be used for certain cryptographic functions. It's not very fast. It's not very good. But the idea is that you can generate keys and store keys in the TPM that will never be released to the system as a whole. The private key is only ever visible to the TPM. And that's a case where we can do more to protect users. When keys are generated for various purposes, we should be doing that on the TPM rather than doing this in a way where the private key remains stored on the user system and can potentially be stolen. One of our strengths in being a free software project is that people can examine the source code that we produce. They can look at that, they can say, OK, I trust that this code does the right thing. But if you're obtaining binaries from somewhere else, it's difficult to know that the binaries themselves are trustworthy, that they have not been tampered with in some way, that the infrastructure that was used to build these binaries has not been modified in such a way that it's injecting backdoors into that code. So the work that Debian and other organizations are doing on reproducible builds is an important thing here.
The idea is that using the same tool chain, I should be able to build from the same source code a bit-for-bit -bit identical binary. There are certain design decisions that can be made in software that make this more difficult. For instance, if when you build code, you embed a timestamp within the binary, that's obviously not going to work well. Cases where you have buffers that are uninitialized, cases where you've got structures that have holes in the middle, can also result in there being differences in the output of the compiler, where you can end up with uninitialized garbage somewhere because you're not going to reference it. Some of those are compiler bugs, some of those are cases where code has not really been written in strict accordance with the C standard, and some of that is it's legitimate as far as the standard is concerned, and it's just poor practices. We should make sure that everything that we are producing is reproducible, that if it's built with the same tool chain, it is identical. Application segregation is, again, a massively important part of this. Right now, if any application in your desktop session has a remotely exploitable security issue, your entire desktop session is compromised. The work that's being done around Flatpak is an amazingly important part of providing safety to all users. Ensuring that there is segregation, ensuring that it's not possible for an arbitrary application to obtain all input events, ensuring that it's not possible for a compromised calculator to read my email and then send that off somewhere is, again, important. Applications that don't need network functionality should not have network functionality. Applications that don't need the ability to read my files should not be able to read my files. Applications that do need to read my files should only be able to do so when I'm explicit about, I want you to open this file. This is something that exists on many other platforms, and it's something that is fundamental to ensuring safety. And I think the work that has been carried out on Flatpak is absolutely vital in this regard. And we should be providing transparency around remote services. Where we use remote services, it should be clear to the user that that is happening. It should be clear to the user what information is being passed and what information is being returned. It should not be up to the user to have to monitor their system's network traffic and figure out whether we're leaking information about them. We should be upfront about that. We should be clear about that. And we should be complete about that. There should be no instances where GNOME applications produce network activity without the user being able to discover why it's doing that. And we should not make any false promises. We should always be clear about what the limitations of what we're doing are. We should not say this platform is safe until we have met our own goals. We should not say that it's safe in any absolute sense. We should say these are the things we care about. These are the things we are trying to protect you against. This is how we're doing that. We should absolutely not say that any new feature brings you safety unless we are able to describe exactly how it does so and what its limitations are. There should be no cases where people end up using our platform and end up harmed because they trusted us, because we were not sufficiently open about where the limitations of our work lay. This is work that is happening around us all the time. People have been working on these issues. Obviously, the work around Flatpak is a huge part of this, but we've also seen projects like Subgraph making use of some of these concepts and attempting to implement an operating system that has many of these characteristics. And they've been hampered because in many cases they're trained to do stuff that isn't really possible yet. They're having to work around limitations of the platform. And so they're coming up with solutions that are not 
necessarily aesthetically pleasing, and in some cases, which are not as safe as they would otherwise be. But when people are trained to take our work and turn it into something better, turn it into something safer, turn it into something that provides more respect for the users, even if those people are doing this work in a way that we feel is incorrect, they are still people that we need to be working with. We need to be reaching out to everybody involved in this kind of work, and we need to be collaborating with them. We can do a lot of this ourselves, but we're going to need more insight. We're going to need more feedback from people who have been working on this for some time. We're going to need to talk to people from the Tor project to identify ways that we can use that technology to protect users. But we're also going to need to avoid touting direct Tor integration in a way that encourages people to use systems in a way that they feel protects them, when in fact there's still enough information leakage that they are not protected at all. But we are still, even though there is a huge amount of work to do, we are still in a much stronger position to do this work than anyone else is. So I look forward to seeing how that work progresses. Thank you. So I have a few minutes. Uh, yeah. And yet, almost all of our core software is written in C, which is a language that's optimized to create holes. So, so like, do you see, see benefit in using something like Fox or C++ with like, two things together? Yeah, uh, fundamentally, from a security perspective, C is suboptimal. And we have a lot of legacy infrastructure and a lot of contemporary infrastructure built around C. I think it is legitimate to start thinking about, is that what we want the future of the platform to look like? Should we be continuing to use C as our primary infrastructural development language? Or should we be thinking about gradually migrating stuff to a safer language like Rust? Uh, it's a great I thing that Longer term, we probably are going to have to start making use of those things because the alternative is trying to protect ourselves against entire bug classes that will just be all over our code base. But focusing too much on that, and this is again why I prefer safety of these sorts of security, privacy, psychotomy. Many of the things that right now will have the biggest impact on our users are completely unrelated to the language of implementation. It's due to the way that our software is behaving or due to the services that we're making use of. Stuff that's not a direct part of our platform, but down to the way that we're using information. And I think that's possibly a more useful focus in the short term. So you talked a lot about how valuable security and privacy Mm -hmm. And you also talk about what do the users what they want. And I think, from my perspective, we have many, many years of example that users in general don't actually want security and privacy. They want convenience and they want free stuff. And how do you reconcile that? Right. So the the security password into your system up, right? <laughs> the security privacy split. Uh, so, sorry, security convenience split is one that people often bring up. You ask users to do something that makes them more secure, and then instead they do something that makes their life more convenient. But, okay, how many people were using Unix environments in the mid-90s or earlier? Sorry for those of you who weren't born yet. <laughs> <laughs> So you used Telnet a bunch, right? Telnet was great. Telnet let you log into other systems. And if you weren't using Telnet, if you were doing stuff on the local network, you might even be using RSH, which was even more convenient than Telnet because you didn't need to type a username. And that was wonderful. And then SSH came along. And SSH was like Telnet or RSH, but it was actually secure. So cool. Um, but. The reasons people migrated to SSH were not necessarily that it was more secure. 
the main reason I started using SSH was that it set up X application boarding for me magically. <laughs> the more secure tool was also the more convenient tool. How secure the X application right. <laughs> <laughs> so there are obviously issues around that. But even so, by providing something that has a more compelling feature set and which was also more secure, users were willing to adopt the more secure solution. And yeah, just plastering security on top of something that already exists, especially if that security is then in the form of you need to type in more passwords or you need to click through more stuff, is never going to work. We're not going to be able to impose security on users if in doing so we make their life more difficult, even if we are aiming to protect them in the long term. This work needs to be done in a way that is still focused on usability and convenience. It's one of the reasons I mentioned subgraph rather than cubes. Cubes is another operating system environment that is built around user privacy and safety as a core component. But it uses full virtualization as isolation rather than using containerization as isolation. So, strictly speaking, cubes should be more secure. <clears throat> the downside is that that's much more difficult for a user to manage. I have difficulty using cubes, and I know a few things about operating systems. Whereas in Subgraph, most things are completely transparent. There's still a few cases where there's extra user interaction involved that doesn't necessarily need to be the case. But we have this trade-off. What's the killer feature of Subgraph? Because I think people want to use it rather than feel like they have to use it or should use it. Right. Again, that's a great question. And I think the answer there is that there isn't really one. But almost everything that Subgraph is doing we could do completely transparently to the user. If we make things more secure without making them less convenient, then people automatically benefit. <clears throat> and a lot of the most important work we can do falls into that kind of category. In things like HTTP, it's invisible to the user if we make that secure, if we ensure that there's no information linkage there. But that's still important, meaningful work. Things like Flatpak should be completely transparent to the user. And in this case, Flatpak's actually a great example of providing more convenience if it's suddenly easier for people to obtain the software they want to run. And in the process, we're also making it more secure. Then again, everybody wins and people will adopt it. So I think that's the kind of work that's most important here. We've got time for one more question. Uh, you were talking about uh, like apps that have no need for network connectivity, should not have any permission to access the network. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's, you know, every app needs to be able to update itself or, you know, get new versions of. It's not necessarily the case that the app should be doing that itself, but that the infrastructure around. Okay. That then could do then so. you get into should the app have to register with a service that you provided through an API to make sure that the service updates it? Should it have an API itself that just makes a call to the headache? Like how should that all be designed? And Great questions. And, and if there's other needs for other functions that also touch the network or other permissions, how, how can you provide a complete API that handles all these different cases and then still provides you security? So one thing here is that we should not let perfect stand in the way of those. Uh, if we can solve basically 90% of the problems and then the other 10% are Applications that don't really need to touch the network are still allowed to because solving this is difficult, fine. That's still way better than where we are now. Yeah. But this is the kind of conversation we need to be having. This is the sort of thing we need to be thinking about in order to identify how we can better solve these problems. And some of these are things where it's very easy for me to stand here and say things like, yeah, app, why does the calculator need network access? Just a legitimate question to ask. Yeah. And then you start thinking about this, and well, okay, maybe there are various subtleties that mean under certain circumstances. Sure, right. The reason that we are generally respected as being able to do magical things is because a lot of what we do is quite difficult, and we are good at coming up with solutions for those. And this is one of those things where we're just going to have to do a really good job. 
So I think I'm out of time now, but again, it was a pleasure and a privilege to be invited here to speak to all of you. Um, thank you for your time.